Hey everybody, welcome back. It's been about a month since I've done a live stream. I've been putting out some recorded stuff and we'll continue to do that, but I definitely would like to try to do a live stream at least once a month. Just the interactivity is just always that much more fun. Um, I put this the announcement of this live stream out to my Patreon community earlier this week and I got a lot of really good questions. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Holdfast, just to start off real quick, talking a little bit about twisted boards, but the primary theme of today is actually going to be saw sharpening, but what I like to call maintenance saw sharpening. Um, so many people, when they, they're intimidated by saw sharpening, and it, it, it can be a little bit intimidating, I get it. It's one of those things where the first time you do it, you're like, what was I afraid of? Um, it's quite a bit easier than it looks. But the other thing is, is when you buy um, a modern made saw um, or even a well-maintained vintage saw, or of course, if you've bought a brand new saw that is sharp when you get it, it's actually really easy to maintain those. There's not really a lot of surgery that needs to happen and more of just kind of following it's already laid out for you. So I want to walk through that maintenance process. I did a, a video on this in the Hand Tool School a couple years ago, and I'm constantly referring people to it because more often than not, we're, we, we watch a how to sharpen a saw video and you get really overwhelmed with all of the shaping teeth and the setting and all that stuff. And nine times out of 10, it's not necessary to go that deep. So I'm gonna talk about that maintenance saw sharpening for probably the lion's share of this. Um, as usual, please, folks in the chat room, welcome. Love having you here live. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, it makes it real easy on me if you put them in all caps just because they stand out from the, the rest of the, the white noise that may be going on in the room. But that being said, I want to kind of dive in. I got a, a question from um, one of my patrons, Andy, and there's that little ad at the bottom. You know, you guys can help guide this show because um, probably all we're going to have time to really cover is the stuff that was submitted by patrons. So, yeah, I will, I will do my best to get the other um, spur of the moment questions because those are always a lot more fun. But certainly... Um, it's an added benefit, I suppose, of, of being a patron of the show. Andy asked about Holdfast, and he specifically has a bench top where he's got, um, it's, it's a top over top of like a cabinet or something, and there's really not a whole bunch of clearance. You know, I've got three feet of clearance beneath my bench top and the shelf on the bottom, so I can use super long Holdfast and not have any problem. His instance is, you know, if you were to use a Holdfast like this, this is a forged fat Holdfast from Black Bear Forge. Um, you know, he would bump into that lower shelf. I don't know exactly how much clearance Andy has, but he was curious what other options there are. So first and foremost, um, he's got a, a thick top, but also not a lot of clearance underneath. There are a lot of people I know of who struggle with uh, hold fast and thicker tops. Honestly, I've never had a problem. I've got uh, three Gramercy Holdfast, toolsforworkingwood.com. I've got three of those. They actually now live up at my in-laws place in Maine on my other workbench. Um, I've got two of these guys forged by Phil Coons up in Alaska. Unfortunately, he is no longer making them. He's retired. I've got two of these kind of, we'll call them knockoffs, but knockoff has a negative connotation to it. Just as fine versions by Black Bear Forge. And those are, these are my favorite Holdfast. They're, they're the sweetest action. They've got a little bit more flex to them than Gramercy. Gramercy is stiffer. Um, and I think that's why some people may struggle with them a little bit. Anybody who's having trouble getting a Gramercy Holdfast to bite, grab some like 60 grit sandpaper and scuff sand the shaft or what I found be really beneficial. Well, I shouldn't say I found to be beneficial. I have a lot of hand tool school students who've done this to great effect is essentially use a nail set and stitch the, the shaft. So just like um, a rasp is stitched using a punch and a hammer and you come in and you dig up, you dig up the little teeth. That's called stitching. You can do the same thing with your Holdfast and you don't have to do, you don't have to make it look like a rasp and have, you know, teeth everywhere. You can just put like a row of teeth on one side, maybe a row of teeth on the other side, or just kind of go randomly. And that adds a little bit of, well, literally tooth or bite to that hold fast, and you may find that the whole thing is gonna grip a lot better. With the hand forged ones, I've never run into this because of that, um, that wrought iron, it's just, it's softer. It's, it's, well, yeah, it's not as hard, it's not as rigid, so it will seat a lot easier. Um, 
There is a difference I've found between these holdfasts from Phil Kuntz and the holdfast from Black Bear. Now you see I hit that and I hit it kind of a little off center and it's still loose. Also, depending on where you hit it, if I hit it down, sorry, let me flip that around. If I hit it down here along this, um, the reach, it doesn't really respond. If I hit it right there, it's firm. It's nice and firm in place. This guy, well, it's already seated. Come on, now it won't unseat. That's another little tip. If you've got the clearance under your bench, uh, it's a real easy way. Once you've seated it, you can just give it a little whack underneath. Um, it requires a lot less force. Um, also, if you've got a bunch of stuff on your bench top and it's kind of hard to get behind it and set it free, just reaching under and tapping it is a good way. This guy will seat no matter how I do it. There's something about the iron that Phil used that's just more, what's the word, ductile, um, than Black Bear Forge. But here again, this, what I discovered was is I, I'm able to be a lot more lazy with this one and I have to be a little bit more precise with that to get it to seat. But at the same time, I mean, the sucker holds, well, like iron. So um, that's why wrought holdfast will end up working better because they just have more flexibility to them and why people tend to have a little bit more trouble with the Gramercy. I don't know so much that it is thickness of the bench top or anything. I think it's more of that flex or lack of flex that you run into with some of the modern manufactured holdfasts. Um, but to Andy's point, when you don't have the clearance, there are holdfasts out there that have a shorter shank. So depending on how much clearance you have, you might be able to get away with a shorter shank. The problem with a shorter shank is, actually I just put this away and I shouldn't. Um, what's nice about these really long ones is I've got, I mean, I can hold things that are quite tall and there's, you know, maybe three inches. The holdfast is not sticking out the bottom of my bench. My bench is four inches tall, four inches thick. It's not sticking out the bottom. So there's, <clears throat> excuse me, less than four inches seated in the bench and still it holds really, really well. Having that long shaft is nice for taller items like this. So if you only, if you have a short shafted holdfast, you may not have that kind of flexibility. The other thing though, is, and I don't actually have any of these to demonstrate, um, Veritas makes something they call a surface clamp. This is Veritas version of a holdfast. I quite like this guy. Um, it's not a whack and seat. And in fact, the shaft itself is a three quarter shaft and it's pretty much almost a perfect match for my, my bench, my dog holes. Like if I try to pull it up at an angle, it'll jam on me. This has a bit of tooth to it. This is exactly what you could do with a Gramercy Holdfast to make it hold better. But what I like about this guy is you're not whacking it to set it. So a lot of times if I'm precisely setting something in place, like say I'm sawing dovetail, uh, sliding dovetail pins uh, or sockets, whatever you want to call it, and I precisely set a sawing fence in place to saw that, if I come in and whack the Holdfast, there's every chance that I may slightly shift the fence. This guy is great because I just set it in place and twist it down. There's no percussive force that can cause something to shift and it holds incredibly well. Well, Veritas also makes something called a surface clamp that operates on the same idea. There is a, a post and this whole arm slides up and down it and it's got a, a knob that twists it in place. The beauty of it is, is the shaft itself has um, an offset mechanism. So as you tighten it down, the offset slides apart and it locks it into the bench. And I believe it's only like three inches long. So it's designed to essentially slip into the bench with you know, any amount of thickness. I think they say it holds like even in like five eighths thick material, something like that. Maybe it's not that thin, but the, the point is if you have no clearance under your bench, that's a really good option for you. Problem obviously, COVID is causing all kinds of shipping logistics issues with Lee Valley. So I think if you order that, you're gonna wait until July, I think I saw on the website today. Um, I'll never pronounce this correctly. Schoberg, the Swedish bench people, um, also make a holdfast that's similar where um, the it's got a, a shaft like this. It's quite a bit shorter. I feel like it's only like three or four inches long. It slides in and there's another post that comes out and screws down. That's another option for you. Finally, Craig makes 
surface clamps. Um, I had one of these before I built this bench and I was just working on like a countertop. You can inlay a clamping plate that's kind of a keyhole and the, the clamp actually slots in place and the whole thing swivels around and it just clamps down really, really strongly. They also make some that actually work in T-tracks. So you could actually inlay a T-track into your bench where I've got my row of dog holes. You could put a T-track right down there. Um, or if you really wanted to, if you've got a hard bench top material, you could actually um, route a T-track profile into the bench if you didn't want you know, metal on your bench top. But the idea is, is those uh, surface clamps would ride up and down in that and would allow you to clamp down and give you surface holding capability. So there are options. Um, I believe Veritas has a few other um, clamping type options like this Wonder Dog, where there are relatively short shafts and the shaft itself goes in the bench dog and then you've got uh, various clamping type components on top of it. So there are certainly options for you to consider in that respect. Um, about 12 years ago, I wrote a blog post on the Renaissance Woodworker called The Battle of Holdfasts. And I, I put Gramercy Holdfasts, I put the Rot Holdfasts, and a couple other models all against one another and tried them in a variety of various thicknesses. And, um, you know, it's something to look at. Honestly, uh, it may, yeah, it's still, it's still um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, relevant, except for the fact that the winner of that was this Phil Coons Holdfast, and I'm sorry, I, I would I would love to be able to refer people to somebody that makes these because they're so wonderful. But uh, I think Phil retired probably eight years ago, so yeah. Next thing is a question from Robin about twist, um, and <laughs> I'm going to be a perfect shill here and say talk a little bit about twist, but at the same time say that I happen to have a lesson, a standalone lesson on the hand tool school for sale <laughs> that uh, can actually teach you this. Um, if we look at, let's see. Ooh, fancy. So um, this is the hand tool school site. There's a whole section for, for lessons. And there is this um, hand planted twisted board lesson that I've had out there for a while. It's 10 bucks, whoops, all kinds of popovers, sorry about that. Um, it's 10 bucks and it's uh, just a 15 minute video um, that will show you the process that I go through in order to uh, deal with twists because it's actually not quite as intuitive as you might think. So that's, that's my, little, my little sales pitch. But the point is, and Robin's question is, if you're using winding sticks, winding sticks will identify that there's some twist going on, but what it may not identify is, is there just twist on one end of the board? Are both end of the boards twisted? How do you actually deal with it? So if you lay out your winding sticks, if anybody doesn't know what winding sticks are, um, it's basically just two sticks that you put on either end of the board. And it really is only apparent or really only relevant with a narrower board. This, 23 inch wide piece of walnut, I don't need winding sticks because I can see the width is there. On a narrower board, it can be sometimes hard to see where the twist is and the winding sticks essentially um, make the board wider and make it more obvious. So I can sight down here and this board is really twisted. I grabbed this one on purpose because it is so unbelievably twisted. It is probably, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I sight along this winding stick, I'm actually seeing like almost the bottom edge of this stick. So it is, what is that? Two inches. It's almost two inches of wind from one end to the other. And that can be particularly difficult to determine where is the twist coming from. If I flip the board over, I can kind of try it again and see where do I have the most twist. In this instance, what I like to do is honestly just hold the board up and sight down it. And what you're looking for is kind of where does the twist actually start? What point does the board start to go crazy? And more importantly, how long of a flat section do you have? So you can do this with winding sticks as well just by changing the position rather than having them on the, the far extents, you can kind of move it down until you get to a point where you're not seeing any twist. And 
And there, I can see, lumber crayon, I don't have twist. So right about there, things are perfectly flat. Well, here's the other perspective. If I flip the board, actually, let's just do it this way. If I now look at the other half of the board or the other two thirds of the board, and I do the same thing, moving the, the sticks down, there's a significant amount of twist even as I move that front stick down. So let's go down to here. Okay, now the twist is starting to subside, but it's still pretty heavy. So if I mark a line there, that tells me, and here, let's just check this again. Let's go from this end to this end. It's twisted, but not that bad. Come another like six inches down the board. It is twisted, but again, it's, it's subtle. So what that's telling me is the major part of the twist on this board is from here to the end. And holding it up and sighting down it and taking the near end and kind of setting it level. You know, think of like a, a horizon on an airplane, setting that uh, on the instrument panel, I mean. Set that level and sight down and you can definitely see this corner down here is my high corner. And what moving those winding sticks down the board told me is, yes, it's a little high in this area, but what really happens is the board kind of, it's moving along straight. It starts to twist a little bit here, maybe a little bit more in there. And then right about here, it goes crazy. It's really twisting up in an angle right there. So in order to address that twist, what I need to do is spot plane this kind of half of the board from here to the end and just go after that, just focus on that little area. And then I can start testing again. And honestly, what I find I end up doing more often than not is I don't pull out my winding sticks because I know that my bench top is flat. I can then flip it over and test the twist and remove a little bit of the high spot. Or sometimes what I'll do is I can see I've got twist here, which means I've got a high edge down here and a high edge down here. So flipping it, I can just make a couple of scrub plane or four plane passes right in just this tiny little area and then in this little tiny area and then flip it and try it again. And if the twist gets dramatically better, you might want to repeat it. If the twist doesn't get that much better, then maybe you only need to remove material from this end and not this end. So some of it is kind of a trial and error and it does actually pay to use your scrub or your four plane set a little bit lighter. You don't want to be taking massive thickness shavings off at this point because until you exactly identify where to where the most efficient place to remove wood is to eliminate the twist, you don't want to be reducing the thickness that much. You want to be taking it nice and light and just checking to see how it goes. The other thing <clears throat> in this particular board, I've got a high spot right on this edge down here. Well, if you look, you can see that blue chalk line. I'm about to turn this into some inlay. This is holly. I'm going to turn it into some inlay and I really need a straight edge. You can see this is the whole holly tree. It's live edge on both sides. I need that straight edge. So I struck a chalk line. Well, the, this is waste out here. And that's also where my high spot is. So as I say time and again, the fastest way to flatten a board is with a saw, not a hand plane. Um, I just so happen I'm going to do inlay on this, what's going to be a desktop. So I actually need this full length. This board used to be about 24 inches longer. And I did all the twisting, twisting, checking and everything. And I discovered this radical amount of twist down here. It only got worse as it extended further down. So I actually cross cut that off because I didn't need that length. I only need it to be as long as this piece. And I'm about uh, four or five inches longer than, than, that, than that walnut right now. So by trimming that off, I got rid of a massive amount of twist. Also knowing I'm going to need to trim this off to get a straight edge, I can get rid of even more twist down here. So think about what you can saw away before you start planing as well. You know, 
Same thing with a bow. If I had a massive bow in this board and I only needed this amount of it, well, cross-cutting is gonna pretty much eliminate that bow. Don't be afraid to flatten your board with a saw, in other words. So yeah, that's the, the long story short on the whole twist thing. It's really kind of trial and error. Taking a lighter cut will allow you to trial without dramatically reducing the thickness of things. Um, let me put these away and then we'll jump into saws. I saw a couple questions that I can see if I can highlight. Um, I'm gonna really focus on the, the saw, the video that I put out last week where I was just cutting your very first dovetail. I used this Husky saw I got at Home Depot for like 10 bucks. And um, what I'm gonna do is actually tune it up. Um, and that's kind of where this question is coming from. So if, if you hadn't, if you hadn't seen that video and you're looking to cut dovetails, it's not a bad place to start. <laughs> How much do I wear about dust in my hand tool shop? It's funny you say that. I'm actually working on a video right now for the hand tool school about that. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't worry about dust that much because I've got that thing, that jet air cleaner on the wall over there. That is uh, my, I don't want to say my first line of defense, but it is behind everything. Um, the dust that I create, I'm not going to say there's not the really harmful submicron stuff in there, but there's very little of it because all the dust I create is with hand tools. So the important thing is the dust particles are larger and they're also not being spun into the air with high RPM tools. The highest RPM tool I have is my lathe and that produces really big shavings. Um, certainly, Different species will affect different people. For me, western red cedar drives me crazy. Stuffy nose, headache, all kinds of stuff. So if I'm using western red cedar, I will wear a respirator. Just protect yourself. Personal protection is always the best way to go. Um, we can't really have dust collection right at the source like you can in power tools. But at the same time, when the dust from a saw pretty much just drops. So if I'm sawing on a bench hook, I will find a pile of dust right off the back of the bench hook. And that's pretty much where the dust goes. Turning on my air cleaner gets rid of the really bad stuff that floats up into the air. Um, when I'm filming, obviously I don't turn it on because it does make a fair amount of noise, but it's also got a timer on it. So every time I leave the shop, I turn that thing on, I actually turn it on high, let it circulate. I think the timer is like five, 10, 30 minutes or something like that. I let it circulate for like 15 minutes and it shuts off on its own and it does its job. Um, that's, that's the beauty of it. The other thing is, is you try to sweep up as much as possible. Now sweeping will actually kick dust up into the air. So I always have my air cleaner running. If I've got a lot, if I've done a lot of work and I've just got a huge mess on the floor, I will put on my respirator while I'm sweeping or I'm lucky that I'm in a garage. I can open the garage door. I have an AC window, AC unit just behind the camera. I turn that on fan, open the garage door, turn on the jet cleaner, which Seems a little silly, but the jet cleaner just gets the air moving. Put on a respirator, sweep up, vacuum up. Um, when I've got a bunch of shavings and chips, I try not to use my dust collector vacuum just because obviously shavings clog a dust collector pretty quickly. So I will sweep up the big particles um, with the respirator and then just let the air cleaner do its job. And it does an amazing job. And I can tell just from, if you do a white glove test in my shop and run along the flat surfaces and things, you're not gonna find a lot of caked dust up there because it's not allowed to actually settle out because of the air cleaner. And that's really the number, the number one thing I rely on. The other thing is, um, there's a trash can right here on purpose off the edge of the bench because my planing stop is here, I'm planing, and the shavings, for the most part, go right into that trash can or very close to the trash can. Or if nothing else, I produce chips and shavings and I just sweep it off the edge right into the trash can. And that keeps a lot of the stuff off the floor that I kick up as I'm tracking around. More importantly, track it into the house. I've got a, a what's it called, floor mat on the floor over there that specifically has this little spiky fingers on it that I wipe my feet on so I'm not tracking uh, dust into the shop. But the other thing, a clean floor, means that when you drop something, you can find it again. If you're standing in a bunch of shavings and you drop that tiny bit of wood that you need to glue back into place, you'll never find that again. So a clean shop floor is great for dust, but it's also great for finding stuff that you drop on the ground. So, yeah. Uh, 
Um, when am I going to install the double gear vise? I think I'm going to install that on my bench in Maine. Um, and I have not been to Maine since COVID kicked in. So um, I'm hoping maybe I can get there in August, in which case I plan to install it then. But yeah. All right. I'm going to, there's some good questions in here, but they're going to take a little bit more time. So let me try to get to uh, the vice or the sawing stuff first. Um, so here's the saw that we're going to be working with. Um, this is my saw vise. I have a, sh a drawer that goes in my saw till. That's where I keep all of my saw, saw sharpening stuff. Uh, I've got this file roll that I got from Veritas. It's got um, a whole bunch of different files in them, some that I've added to it. Um, saw sets, got a hammer set in here, a couple of pistol grip sets, and a uh, file handle. I do have one of these fancy saw guides. Veritas makes one of these. This was actually produced by Blackburn Toolworks. Um, it's just fancy. <laughs> it's made out of, what is this, brass, solid brass? Nice walnut handle. It does have a, a plumb bob level on top, which the Veritas doesn't have, which can help you just keep everything nice and straight. But to be honest, the saw sharpening I'm gonna to do today and the saw sharpening that I do for most of my saws, most of the time, I don't use this um, because all I'm gonna do is match the geometry that already exists. So one of the questions I got was, how do you know what tooth geometry exists? Like, how do you match it? And this comes out of people who are using one of these guides. And you wanna set your, your, you can twist the barrel of this to set your rake angle. You can set this fence to set your fleam angle. And so you wanna know, okay, I've got a 20 degree fleam and I've got 10 degrees rake. So you can dial in the settings on this little guide. Well, it's really hard to actually measure these, especially on a saw like this that's really fine tooth. I actually don't know what the pitch is on this. As I said, it was a Home Depot saw. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, it might be 15, might be 16, I don't know. It's dovetail saw pitch, in other words. Um, it, their teeth are really small, so it can be kind of hard to, to see what to do. One thing that you can do is I will set it in the vise. First rule of thumb is you want to grab a file that is a little bit more than twice the depth of the gullets. So I will set, that's way, way too big. I think I'm just going to go straight to my needle file on this. Well, I don't know. I think I can use a double extra slim, four inch double extra slim. All right, so I'm setting it in there and I realize I'd have to get really, really close and it probably wouldn't be in focus anyway. But I set it in and I see how far the tooth rises up the face of the file. And I want that to be just below the center line. And the reason for that is as I'm cutting here, I'm wearing away the file. And if I use a file that's smaller where the tooth line surpasses that center line, I'm also wearing away the other side. So when I rotate the file and try to get a clean face, I wanna have a clean face. And if I'm removing too much material, uh, the, the file is running too deep, I'm actually killing that entire face in one pass. And I could actually flip it over and go, you know, and use that other face. There are um, six, cutting edges on this file. There's certainly, it's a triangular saw file. There's certainly the three faces, but the arises themselves are also tooth. They're also cutting. So I don't want to be removing too much material um, by having the saw file sitting too deeply in those gullets. But here's the other thing. What I'll do is put that handle on. I will, very light grip on things and kind of balance the file so that it, it, it wants to rest somewhat evenly. And I just press down. And what's happening is the saw file, it, it was running 
nearly perpendicular. As I pressed down, it kicked over a little bit. So there is a fleam on this. There is a fleam angle. Whatever that fleam angle is, it looks like it's probably uh, between five and 10 degrees. I don't really care. Um, but the geometry is telling me just the way the saw file is sitting in there, it's telling me that there is some fleam angle. As I look down here, this top surface is almost parallel to the tooth line. And what do we know about a triangle? This file is an equilateral triangle, so it's 60 degrees on every edge. So I've got rake. I don't have 90 degrees of rake like I would like to have on a dovetail saw, um, or zero degrees of rake, I should say, straight up and down. I've actually got 30 degrees of rake. The tooth is angled back at 30 degrees. And this is not a dovetail saw. It actually says on the plate, miter box saw. That's what it's designed to be. So it's expected that there would be a little bit of fleam. More importantly, I find that these cheaper saws, I think the fleam is more of an accident than anything else. What they're really doing is relaxing the rake and making it glide over the wood a lot more. You also will find that a lot of these miter box saws have an equilateral triangle tooth. They've got that 30 degrees of rake, um, which is sometimes called a peg tooth. So let me switch to a wider angle here. When you've got your saw, if this is the front leading edge here, this is zero degrees of rake. The, the tooth is running straight up and down. A peg tooth is gonna be Oops, that wasn't very clear. Let's make that darker. <laughs> a peg tooth is more even. Um, it's gonna have 30 degrees, 30 degrees, you know, that combined 60 degree angle. So it looks like an equilateral triangle. Obviously this is not an equilateral triangle. It's, it's acute, this angle is acute of that, but it's even on the same side. So the cutting edge is the same angle as the, the back, the non-cutting edge. And what ends up happening is anytime you use the saw, let me just grab another one rather than take that out of the vise. The peg tooth works really well perpendicular to the wood. And if you think about your average miter box, um, it's going to hold the saw, the tooth line, parallel to the surface of the wood. And it's meant to just run straight back and forth. In other words, you're not dropping the handle or raising the handle or anything. You're keeping it right in line. And that peg tooth will cut cleaner i don't even want to say cleaner smoother it's super easy to start because you've got that way 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 relaxed rake but it's also much less aggressive so they will cut a little bit slower but therefore also give you a somewhat cleaner cut um, the minute you start angling it and if you watched my first dovetail video i was getting a fair amount of growl on this this saw on the backstroke and that's because this peg tooth look it it's kind of sinks deeper into the into the wood it's meant to ride on top at this angle when i lower that angle it sets down in the gullets a little bit more and that higher angle of the the back side of the tooth tends to grab a lot more and it vibrates quite a bit really the ideal would be much less rake um, much, much less than 30 degrees. Like if I'm doing a dovetail saw, it's a rip cut. I really want that chisel shaped tooth, that zero degrees of rake. Some people will maybe drop four or excuse me, five to 10 degrees of rake because it will be easier to start, especially on harder woods. Personally, I really like a zero degree rake angle on my dovetail saw. I want it to be more aggressive. The teeth are fine enough. The pitch is fine enough that it's easy enough to start. It's gonna leave a clean cut because the teeth are so small. So I might as well stack the cards in my favor and make a more aggressive, faster cutting rake angle paired with the slower cutting tiny little teeth. It's also just a heck of a lot easier to sharpen when you're working at 90 degrees. The problem with this saw, and this is what I would say, is I don't wanna make any changes right now. I just wanna sharpen it. It's probably pretty sharp. The way it's performing told me that it was pretty sharp, but I just want to get it sharp first and see how it reacts, see how it responds when it's a little bit sharper. Plus, I also find that just the human error of hand sharpening a saw 
adds a little bit of variability to the shape of the teeth, the, the, the angle of the rake and all that, which actually makes the saw cut a little bit sweeter. It's the same reason there's a difference between machine stitched rasps and hand stitched rasps. The slight variance, variability more importantly, in the, the location of the teeth allows it to kind of keep the wood guessing and the whole thing cuts just a little bit smoother. So in this case, if I get a saw and it's, it's new like this, before I start doing surgery and shaping tooth geometry and all that stuff, I just wanna make sure the sucker is sharp and see how it responds from there. Then it's a matter of figuring out what do I really want that saw to do? Do I wanna use this as a dovetail saw? Frankly, no, I really don't. Um, I mean, just look at it. I mean, it's a 14 inch saw. Uh, I've got a 12 inch dovetail saw that I like. 14 inches is getting a bit long for a dovetail saw. There's too much cantilevered weight. It can be a little bit difficult to deal with that. I think 12 inches is really the maximum for dovetail saws. You find that many of them are much, much shorter than that. Eight inches, uh, six inches is also is, is quite common. So this probably would be more of, a, it would be better um, like a miter box saw. Not so much a miter box saw, but for cutting, cross cuts. Um, it's already got that highly relaxed rate to it, which is the other point. If I have a relaxed rake tooth, so like this, and I wanted to convert it into a rip saw, I would want that, we'll just make this the front of the saw, so this is really my cutting angle. I would want to steepen this angle. What I really want is 90 degrees. Well, you can see the problem there. If I'm removing this steel in order to get 90 degrees, what I've got left is this skinny little tooth, which may actually look a lot like a Japanese tooth, but there's a different kind of geometry going on there. You are relieving a hell of a lot of material. And in order to get a robust tooth, you're gonna want a little bit shallower angle on the back side of that tooth to look a little bit more like that. So I can't add steel back on. So it's really difficult to go from a cross cut saw back to a rip cut saw. More often than not, what you end up doing is cutting the teeth down and then starting over, making your tooth from there. You've got a little bit more, but that involves heavy duty surgery. This is open heart surgery here. It's a lot of work. So if I had a saw, I do have a saw like this, trying to convert it into a rip saw is gonna be a lot more work. I could take this peg tooth and steepen the angle a little bit and still have some teeth left, knowing that the narrower that tooth is, the more brittle it's gonna be over time. What probably makes the most sense is to um, keep the tooth shape the way it is subtly adjust it over time, because obviously every time you sharpen it, you are shortening the tooth just a little bit, you know, or you can joint the tooth, uh, get everything nice and flat, which is gonna shorten it as well. The further you go down that triangle, the thicker the steel gets. If you have a rip tooth, it can be easier to, to add rake to that. So you have to kind of choose your battles. You don't necessarily want to just immediately jump from, well, I want to rip and it's cross cut and just go right there. That's a lot of steel removal. As I said, you'd be better off with something this fine. The teeth are really not that big. You'd be better off jointing the sucker to like there's almost no teeth left. I wouldn't joint the teeth, the tooth line away completely. If you keep a little bit of the tooth line, then you can actually still see the pitch and you actually don't, don't have to remark the pitch. You can rely upon the same pitch and then start shaping your teeth from there. But that's not what I'm doing today. That was, that was kind of the intro to all of this, to just to say that really what I want to do is sharpen this just as it is. Ugh, this saw is like a half an inch too long, maybe a quarter inch too long for the vise. Well, that's all right. That'll work. So I set it and lock it in my vise so that it's just a little bit above the top line of the vise. See if I can get a little bit closer without going too out of focus here. Easy question to one of the answers in the chat room, why two leg vices? Um, 
because at the time when I was building this bench, it seemed like a really cool idea. Um, it is fantastic for really wide panels. Um, if you've got, you know, sheet of plywood or solid wood that's greater than 24 inches, it's fantastic to hold both sides of it, but it gets used so very little. It was kind of uh, a cool thing to do at the time. Um, I don't regret it because I, what I end up doing now is just using that leg vise on the other side of the bench. It's just another vise. Um, but yeah, I don't think if I did it again, I probably wouldn't go through the effort. Plus I used wooden screws on the whole thing and those suckers are expensive. So yeah, it's just not seemed like a cool idea, but I really don't use it all that much. Uh, okay. So what I want to do is, and you know, if you're just getting started, I'm actually going to do this right-handed so that it shows up better on camera. If you're just getting started, uh, first time you've ever sharpened uh, a saw, you can use like the handle comes to right about here. So very little of this tooth line actually gets used. What you'll find is like that last inch of the tooth line probably never gets touched. So this is a great warm up spot. Sometimes the same can be said about the toe where like the, the first inch or maybe half inch may not get used all that much. I actually use the toes of my saws quite a bit. Um, for kind of blind cuts and stuff, but this is a great place to warm up. You can drop it on the tooth line, and if it takes a couple of strokes of the saw just to kind of get the rhythm right, it's perfectly fine here. Um, reposition some lights so that I can see. Um, you can sit down when you do this. I actually prefer to stand because the angle, the height of this is set just to the point where my elbow's off camera but it's my arm, my forearm is pretty much parallel to the ground. So I can take a, a, a good wide stable stance just like I would when I was sawing and I actually can saw or excuse me, file quite easily without imparting any angle in this direction which would give me sloping gullets and I don't really want to do that. So what I do want to do however You have some layout fluid, that's fine. I just use a Sharpie marker and I use the same Sharpie marker because this tears up your Sharpie marker. And this guy has been used for several years and there's almost nothing left. I gotta go get a new Sharpie. But that won't really show up on camera, but it, it's dulled the, the top and I can see the black Sharpie. So what I'm wanting to do here is file until it's gone and you it's really apparent like you shouldn't have to go did i get it no it's shining some of that is the way i've got i've got a light coming in from this angle and coming in from this angle on purpose so it is giving me the reflection that i want right away and i've got a pretty loose grip with my hand back here. I've got the palm of my hand sitting on the handle, so the push is happening kind of right from there. I'm not really gripping it tightly. This is kind of for balance. I'm not pulling or anything. The whole idea is I'm letting the existing geometry guide the file. The existing geometry, as I set it in there, is creating the rake angle and creating the fleam angle. Now these teeth are pretty small. So if I have a really you know, rigid grip and I keep my, my wrist locked in place, there's every possibility that I could actually impart a new geometry here. And that's why you wanna have just a nice light grip. People talk about this with sawing, where you wanna have that light grip on the handle so that you're not forcing the saw to do something it doesn't wanna do. Oops, that was kind of bad. There we go. And it's kind of like starting a saw where I don't want to have a huge amount of pressure down on things. I want to have it light enough that it smoothly cuts like that. The more I push down on it, the more it's going to kind of stutter. So you focus your, your force 
forward rather than down. And you will find that the file cuts much smoother. The other thing is, is if I put too much weight on the handle, kind of push down on it, it will start to, to stutter a little. You wanna be pushing straight across the top. So if you do find that the saw file is stuttering, just kind of relax your grip on the handle back here. So now I'm like two inches into the tooth line. And at this point, I really have a feel for the rhythm. I kind of warmed up on those, <laughs> call them unnecessary teeth at the back. And I can start progressing quite a bit faster. Now is the time when I need like an audible chat room. Because I could just keep sharpening and answer questions here. I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions that I can actually answer. Solvice is a Gramercy Solvice. Um, preferred file manufacturer, I really don't have one because honestly, I don't have to sharpen saws that much. And I use saws every single day. Now I'm coming back to the tooth line and you, you know, the teeth are small and it's like, well, where do I pick up? So I'm looking for that shiny bit and there's the Sharpie again. So I know exactly where to pick up. And that's actually what I'm looking at as I advance the tooth. So um, I have in my little file holder here, I have some Grobe files. I have some Nicholson files. Um, I've used a third one too and the brand is, is escaping me, but they're all fine. I haven't had any issues where they wear out like super fast, but I also don't um, manufacture saws for a living. I don't sharpen saws for a living. So in my everyday shop usage, I mean, even like the saws that I use the most around here, like my sash saw that lives in my tool cabinet, I sharpen that sucker maybe once every six months. I've got um, a much larger 16 inch crosscut saw that I've had for probably eight years. I've sharpened it maybe four times, maybe five times. It's just not in your typical shop. We just don't have to sharpen our saws that much. So if I'm wearing out files, I'm not noticing it. Um, so yeah, I hear from a lot of people who say, oh, I don't like Grobe files. I've also heard I don't like Nicholson files. I just don't sharpen enough saws that it makes a difference. So I would say preferred saw file manufacturer, what I can get, because that's been the harder thing lately is actually being able to find manufacturers that aren't out of stock. The other thing with finely pitched saw like this is there's really, I mean, you can see I'm taking one pass per tooth. Teeth are so small, there's no reason to have to make multiple passes. I'm getting all the steel removed here adhering to the existing geometry. And I think I can get this without having to shift the saw. So now that's definitely got that nice sticky sharp feel. Your fingers just stick to the sucker. And I can look down here and I can see shiny metal the whole way around. So what have I created here? Baco, thank you. That's the, those, that's the other brand name, Baco Files. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of those in there as well. Um, so now, I mean, again, I can hold this up to the light and I'm looking to make sure that I've got shiny teeth the whole way. There's no dark spots that I've missed. But then I kind of look along the tooth line and I just want to make sure that I don't have any teeth that I like completely botched and I reshaped. The teeth should all look the same shape or ish very close to the same shape. 
Um, I can tell you right now, this saw is a hell of a lot sharper than when it came out of the box. But I haven't really changed anything. If I have, it's not noticeable. It's, it's imperceptible. Um, and I've just adhered to the existing geometry. So what is the geometry of this saw? Can't be certain. I mean, technically I could use a protractor. I could use a, a saw file, drop the saw file in and use a protractor to, to capture those angles. But I'm not gonna be real precious about that because what's that gonna do for me? If, if I determine it's got a 30 degree rake angle and I really would rather it be 10 degree rake angle, again, that's a problem. Now I'm removing steel and giving myself a really tiny tooth. I have this saw, it may have some faults to it, but let's make the best of it and just make sure that the sucker is sharp. I can do the exact same process you just saw for like 10 years, maybe not 10 years. Every time I sharpen it, I was the teeth are getting a little bit smaller. I probably would want to joint the tooth line three, four sharpenings from now, just to be certain that everything's about the same. Um, if you find the saw is kind of stuttering and vibrating a lot, you might have some uneven teeth and you can just look at it and see if the teeth are uneven. So then you end up jointing it. Once you joint it, there may be a little bit more removal, but honestly, I mean, really? <laughs> I mean, that's, it's cutting a hell of a lot faster than it was in the dovetail video, it's starting super easy. And that's always the key that you've got a sharp saw. If the saw is stuttering and it's really difficult to start, start on the push stroke, certainly a lot of that is technique, a lot of that is proper weight management of the, the saw, but there is no reason you should ever have to do these backstroke BS. That's ridiculous. All that does is dull the tooth line and deform the wood and it reduces the accuracy and the precision of the saw. You wanna start that saw on the push stroke and it should be super easy. It should start like butter. Now, because the rake angle is so severe on this, it's gonna start easier. But this, like if you were to go back and watch that first dovetail video, like the most recent video I have, you will see that it, it stuttered a little bit on me. It certainly didn't start like that and it certainly, didn't cut that fast either. Here's the other thing. Look at these curves. Here are three curves and they are parallel. So the saw is not drifting one way or another. Um, they're not exactly parallel, but that's human error. Um, you get the idea. The saw is not dramatically drifting one way or another. We're you know, two inches into the wood here and we don't see any deviation. So there's no reason to worry about resetting this or doing anything. The saw is not binding in the slightest, so it's got plenty of set. It's cutting super fast. And yeah, I mean, I'm done. I, what, what else could I really ask of this saw um, that I would want to change? Mostly because it's so finely pitched to begin with. I mean, here's my sash saw. This is like my favorite saw. This is a 12 points per inch saw. This, as I said, it's 15 to 16, if I counted correctly. This is definitely not a dovetail saw. Um, I want this to cut more aggressively. This, with the pitch being so fine already, there's only so much I can ask of it. You know, I don't really want to cut tenons with this guy. I mean, I could, but it's going to be slow, especially if you're cutting three, four inch long tenons. The heavy duty rip cut through a lot of wood, this is going to be a, a lot slower. But this could be a great carcass saw. It's finer than I would like for a carcass saw. I like about 12 points per inch, maybe 14 at most for a carcass saw. It would work though. I mean, the hang angle is certainly right. It's hung a little bit higher like that. Um, so this, I'm perfectly fine with this. I mean, the, the biggest issue you'll find with some of these saws is they're just not exactly sharp. They're kind of sharp, <laughs> just not quite there. And that ability to start so much cleaner and cut that much faster, just with, what was that? Like between me yabbering on, it was five minutes maybe to sharpen it. And there was no guide needed. It was just a light grip letting the saw file adhere to the existing geometry. And that ends up giving you, you know, what, what you need. Um, if you find that I do that sharpening, I go through that kind of lighter grip and I hold this saw up and I go, oh crap, what did I do? <laughs> what have I done? I know, and the teeth are like really ragged looking and not the same shape. You're gripping the thing too tight. Um, and yes, 
you, you didn't ruin the saw, but you just made a hell of a lot more work for yourself. Um, now you're gonna have to go back to actually shaping the teeth and creating an even geometry or like consistent geometry along the tooth line. But what you'll find, just as I was showing when I was sharpening, if you're not matching that existing geometry, you will find that the saw file will catch and it will stutter and it won't go cleanly across. So that's the kind of use your eyes and your ears as you're sharpening. And if you're struggling, no, I was gonna say maybe the saw file is dull, but if the saw file is dull, it's actually gonna glide even easier because the teeth have worn down on the file. If you find that you're having trouble getting the file started, relax your grip, double check that you're, you're adhering to that angle, nice and relaxed, and you will find that it will skate across without a problem. Um, especially on a fine tooth like this, you shouldn't be taking more than one pass per tooth as well. So yeah. Um, Yes, a saw file, sorry, the question is, oh, hi, Robin. Um, the, the saw, does the saw file cut on the front and back of the tooth at the same time? It absolutely does. Um, the only reason that it wouldn't is if the angle between one tooth and the other is greater than the 60 degree angle of the saw file. The triangular saw file has got a 60 degree angle. So it's creating that same angle all the way down. And this has that same angle, that they're equilateral triangles. So it's 60 degrees in the gullet, 60 degrees at the point, 60 degrees in the next gullet. The changing the rake angle still gives you that 60 degree combined angle. Um, it's just angled one way or another. You know, as I take that front tooth and I stand it up straighter so that it's zero degrees, I still have that same combined angle that you can't do anything but create that because the saw file is cutting on all sides at the same time. Here again, which is why you want a saw file that's slightly more than twice the height of the tooth line because it's cutting on the front and the back at the same time. You can, when you're, when you're changing the geometry of the tooth, when you're changing that cutting angle, the back angle of the tooth obviously is not cutting. And that, the back of the tooth is being shaped as you cut the cutting angle of the tooth behind it, right? You know, you, if you're working on the front of this tooth, when you shift to work on the front of this tooth, you're now also cutting the back of the tooth in front of it. Um, you can move that back and forth. You can remove a little bit more steel off the back side of a tooth by applying lateral pressure. It's what's called crowding the file. So. If I know, if I'm, you know, um, if I've jointed the saw and I've got, I can see flats on the top, what you obviously want to do is remove steel from the front and the back of the tooth so that you come to that point evenly. If I remove all the steel from the front of the tooth, then I can end up with a tooth that's actually shorter than the rest of the tooth line. So you want to try to get there evenly. And this is why like shaping teeth, it's a whole other thing. We didn't do that here. There's no reason to do that on this saw. It does add a level of complexity because you have to get there. You have to get the, the front angle and the back angle at the same time. So technically, as I sharpen the cutting face, the front angle of one tooth, I don't want to remove the flat. I want to remove the flat when I shift to the next tooth and I remove a little bit of material from the back side of the tooth at the same time. So you get to that flat, you know, evenly. So you get an even tooth line. It kind of makes your brain go crazy when you start thinking about it. In the end, you're moving down the tooth line. I don't want to try to take a whole bunch of passes on one tooth unless I've got a really, really low tooth or um, a really, really big flat on top of the tooth. And that's why we go and joint the teeth to give us that consistent height of the tooth line. And you may have a tooth that's got you know, a really wide flat on, a tooth next to it's got a tiny little flat. And as I work the back side of the wider flat, I don't want to be removing a bunch of material from the next tooth in line. So I will crowd the file over to the wider flat and remove more material. Technically, I'm still removing material on the other side of the file, but very little because I'm putting pressure kind of leading into the cut a little bit. That's, that's the art form of, of saw tooth geometry and shaping saw teeth. We didn't shape any saw teeth we sharpened saw teeth, and there is a, dick, a big difference between shaping and sharpening. So, um, 
Yeah, um, yes, it's a 14 inch saw and 15 PPI is definitely too narrow or too fine. I, I totally agree. This is the problem with cheaper saws. I could join away these tooth line and create whatever I wanted. I could create a sash saw. You'll notice these saws are the same length. 14 inches is a great sash saw length, but this is a coarser pitch. To change the pitch, you gotta remove the teeth entirely and then re-pitch the whole saw. Um, so that, there's the problem. Modern saws always tend to have a finer pitch because a finer pitch is easier to start. They always tend to have um, higher rake angles because a higher rake angle or a relaxed rake angle is easier to start. Most people don't know how to use a saw. Um, there is a technique to getting the saw started. And if you don't know that, things not starting and you get problems. So what the saw manufacturers do is make saws super easy to start. They do that by sacrificing the aggressiveness of the saw, sacrificing the geometry of the saw in order to give it more of this kind of bland vanilla feel to it. Is it rip? Is it cross cut? It's a little bit of everything. It's a one size fits all saw. Well, master of none, in other words. Um, all of my tenon saws have zero degrees of rake and they're coarser pitch saws because that's what I want for cutting a tenon. I don't have a hybrid file or any of that stuff. My apologies to Mark Harrell. He makes great saws at Bad Axe. I don't believe in hybrid filing. Why would I do that? If I had one saw, hybrid filing is a good idea. I don't. I have lots of saws. I love my saws. I want my saws to be specifically tuned for the job that I, I want it for. And when I buy a saw like this, I'm kind of, I'm kind of stuck until I remove all the teeth and start over. I can't really do much with a 15 points per inch saw other than cut dovetails, you know, or fine joinery work like this. But if the saw is sharp, it's still gonna do a decent job, especially a lot better than, than a dull saw. So, you know, that maintenance thing will, will definitely get you there. So that being said, um, I think I will call it a night. Did I, there's a question in here about wood bodied versus metal. Um, that's a longer answer <laughs> that I need to, to answer. Um, I do not live cast every Wednesday. I used to, um, I'm trying to intersperse recorded videos and live videos, live stream. Um, so I'd like to try to do it once a month. They will always be on Wednesdays and they will probably be around 5.30. Um, at least while I continue to work from home during COVID, they'll be around 5.30. Um, once I go back into the office, I need some time. They may shift to a little bit later, but yeah. Um, I always announce every time I do one of these live streams um, on Patreon, and I usually do it on my Instagram as well, although I didn't this week now that I think about it. So, um, a standard handle seems too small. Just got a Veritas dovetail saw, and either my index or my pinky finger have to hang off. Is that normal? Um, the dovetail saw. Um, no, <laughs> that's too small. And I've actually found Veritas saws, um, they're particularly tight. Um, and I mean, I have, I have a larger hand. You may have particularly large hands. I mean, they the mass produced saws like Lee Nielsen and Veritas, it's funny because those have become middle of the road saws. <laughs> like Lee Nielsen and Veritas have always been like the, the golden examples. And I think from hand plane perspective, they still are. When it comes to hand saws though, there's so many boutique makers out there now that they're middle, middle of the road type saws. Crazy, right? Um, but I mean, this is, this is how it fits. I mean, this is the perfect fit on my hand. You can see all three of those fingers wrap around without a problem. I don't have that pinky hanging out there. Um, and it's, it's a perfect fit for my hand. I find that Veritas handles are a bit small, certainly for a six foot four guy with big hands. Um, I also don't like the geometry of Veritas handles. To be perfectly honest, I don't like Veritas saws. Um, I love Veritas planes. I love most of Veritas tools. I do not like their saws. Tooth geometry on their saws is really wonky. Um, their dovetail saw in particular, I'm not a fan of, um, but I am a fan of the price tag. Super inexpensive, good saw for the money. Um, I recommend filing a dovetail, Veritas dovetail saw and adding about 10 degrees of rake angle on it. Um, it will start a little bit better. It's not that it's not sharp or the rake angle is incorrect for a dovetail saw, but the way the handle is hung for a dovetail saw and the rake angle don't jive and it's kind of awkward. So um, yeah, I actually did that. I, I think it was in the hand tool school. I, I did a Veritas dovetail saw rework um, and it, you know, night and day, and it took about as long as what we saw here. 
It was just kind of touching up the teeth, adding a little bit of rake. Um, there was really no reason to dramatically reshape the teeth because it was like additional couple degrees of rake, five degrees of rake over what they already had. And it just kind of softened it and it made it jive with that higher hang angle that is um, present on the saw. The other thing you'll find if you're struggling with it, um, obviously you're struggling with the handle size, but if you drop the handle a little bit more, cut it at a, at a higher angle, you will find that it cuts a little bit sweeter than trying to go straight across the wood. Fortunately, most people, when they saw dovetails, that's what they do. They come up to the board and they square off to it and they cut like that. You'll find that dropping that handle, the dovetail saw, excuse me, the Veritas saw will certainly cut a lot sweeter. The problem is if you, your bench is low, you know, typical planing bench, you've already got that geometry going with you and you end up bending over like this in order to saw, which is just not sustainable with a bunch of dovetails. So then you build a big joinery bench like what the camera's sitting on. So yeah. Uh, Sawtooth geometry is a wonderful rabbit hole. Dive down it, go after it. I've got a, a bunch of videos on here that talk about sawtooth geometry that uh, I love it because you can tweak your saws and have them do all kinds of really cool stuff. And you can, you know, pick up some extra vintage saws and tune them to do certain things. You've got a softwood saw, you've got a hardwood saw, you've got a greenwood saw, you know, you've got a, a, a sash saw, a tenon saw, a half blind dovetail saw. I have one of those. Um, this. Where is it? I've lost my half blind dovetail saw. Well, that's weird. Okay, I'll have to figure that out. I seem to have misplaced it. Whatever, it's got a higher hang angle and a different tooth geometry. But that's the cool thing is you can mess with these little things and tweak them in order to get them to perform better in a specific situation. If you're cutting sliding dovetail pins or even short pins on a carcass front like this, that higher rake angle um, of that half blind saw is really great for that. So, but I digress. All right, guys, have a great night. Um, if I didn't get to your question, I apologize. There's only so many hours I can do this. If this runs any longer, people start thumbs downing me. <laughs> so have a uh, great night, everybody. And um, I will announce when I do this again. Um, look for a new video next week for me. <laughs>